Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 468th New Social Environment. I'm Ty, the Senior Production Assistant here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Adam Pendleton, Amanda Globizi, and Zoe Hopkins. We are thrilled to have the poet here, poet Alma Birch here, who will read to close today's program. A few notes before we get started. The rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on the Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wapinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenape Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat in just a moment for a living document of resources and actions. And now to introduce today's guest and hosts. Artist Adam Pendleton's multidisciplinary practice uses text, gesture, and appropriated imagery to reconsider social resistance, avant-garde art, and underrepresented historical movements. Across silkscreen paintings, photographic collage, video, performance, and publishing, Pendleton filters ideas and aesthetics from the Black arts movement, minimalism, conceptualism, and Dada through a graphic monochromatic palette. Pendleton describes his work as Black Dada, a phrase coined by the poet Amiri Baraka. His current exhibition, Who is Queen?, is on view at the Museum of Modern Art, New York through February 21st, 2022. Formerly associate professor at Ohio State University, Amanda Globizi is the founding co-director of the New Foundation for Art History and art scene editor for the Brooklyn Rail. Amanda is the author of Art and Design in 1960s New York from Anthem Press 2021. Writer Zoe Hopkins studies art history and African-American studies at Harvard University. Her writing has appeared in Hyperallergic, the Brooklyn Rail, and White Hot Magazine of Contemporary Art. Zoe and Amanda, please take it away. Thanks, Ty. Thank you, Ty. Um, such a pleasure to be here today. And Adam, we're very excited to have you here at The Rail for this conversation. Um, and congratulations again on an extraordinary show. Um, if you're in the New York area and haven't yet gotten a chance, I believe it's open until January 30th. Um, so there's still time to see this um, really once in a lifetime um, installation um, at MoMA's atrium. Up until February 21st. February 21st, oh, fantastic, okay. Excellent. Zoe, do you wanna take it away? Perfect, yes. So um, Adam, I suppose my first question for you um, is really about your kind of concept of history um, and your concept of the archive. Of course, um, for those of you who have seen the show, you'll know that the installation draws heavily on archival materials from photographic documentation of Resurrection City, um, which was a demonstration and kind of tent city built in the wake of Martin Luther King's assassination in 1968. Um, and then there are also sort of sonic archival sounds um, from Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter demonstrations, um, from you know spoken word, um, etc. Um, but the way that you deal with the archive, Adam, and who is Queen, was I thought really defiant of our expectations of what the archive can be. I think we have a very limited understanding of the archive sometimes as this kind of arid clinical space. Um, it's often reduced to um, something kind of unliving um, because it is in the past, it's history. Um, but the way the archive appears in your work, it's very alive um, and it bristles with, you know, both the sonic and the visual. Um, it has this animacy that's kind of almost haptic. Um, and so I was really drawn to the way you you deal with the archive um, and I'm curious to hear a bit about your method in approaching archives um, what makes an archival encounter meaningful for you when you're drawn to something in the archive how do you know you're drawn to it why are you drawn to it um, what guides you to it and then you know for who is queen how did you go about assembling the archival materials that you ended up using so I, I Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Amanda, Brooklyn Rail, everybody. I'm happy to be here this afternoon. Um, I, I, so I, just to, 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 to break down that question a little bit and to 
put certain things into context. So on the one hand, who is queen as a work of art is an archive itself. It's a kind of poetic, experimental, irrational, illogical archive, which I would argue all archives are, while they try to perhaps at moments seem organized and orderly and contained, I think they're all bristling with possibility and potential. And conceptually, visually, theoretically, Queen puts that inherent quality or element of any archive on full display. But the who is Queen as an archive, archives very different kinds of materials. I think primary for me are the visual materials that are generated and are then archived within the space of the work. And a lot of those visual materials are drawn, painted, written by me. So it's generated by myself. And then there's this kind of diversion where material from other archives are brought into the space of the work. So just to speak specifically about the sound collage, that yes, it has excerpts from the Black, a Black Lives Matter solidarity protest that took place, I believe it was in 2014. There's also a composition by the composer Han Rowe. There's also music by Jason Moran. There's a reading that Amiri Baraka did at the Walker Art Center in the 1980s. And all of these things are collapsed into a kind of a sonic space, which is also, a, for me at least, a kind of visual space as well. And in a way it becomes the way in which you read the, the paintings and the drawing and the structure itself. So while you hear it and you look, so in other words, all of the senses are put to work. The whole body becomes a part of how you experience the piece. And the video work, Zoe, you spoke to Resurrection City. And so on the screen that is a part of Who is Queen, there are three video works and one of them, yes, is a piece that uses archival footage that documented Resurrection City. So in other, there are sort of these three different ways in which archival or material is used. And that is, again, material that I've generated, material that I've heard, and then moving image footage. So there's a kind of a material reality as much as there is a conceptual and the theoretical reality, realities, I should say, that I'm contending with in the space of the work. I really love what you said about the archive as a, a kind of multi-sensory experience because I, I, I don't think that we tend to imagine archives as spaces that activate us to, to, to feel and to experience in a way that, um, that, that is sort of haptic or that is sensorial. Um, so I, and, and that's definitely something that I experienced visiting the show. Um, the, the archive is very much kind of woven into um, a, a multi-sensorial texture, um, which I really appreciated. Um, and I know also, you know, Dada has been a huge concept for you, um, as is evidenced by your Black Dada manifesto. Um, and of course, the Dadaists were famous for their use of found objects and, um, um, you know, kind of reinventing what is what 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 our conceptions of objects are as they operate in everyday life and then kind of repurposing them. And um, I think we can think of the found materials and who is queen um, as a kind of Dadaist intervention in that sense a little bit. Yes, it, it also, it, it, it's interesting to think about a process of transformation when the, this, 
this sort of transitional moment where the found material is no longer, at least in my understanding, a found material anymore. It's, it's kind of raw material. It becomes raw material and then it becomes embedded in the space of the work. So it's also, it's, it's, a kind, it's also about a kind of permission and how do you seek permission? How do you access things? What do you have permission to use? Which always fascinates me. And I, I think it's, it's cumbersome and it's, it's complicated, you know, to basically borrow space, borrow language, borrow an image, even borrow a moment. But history is material. It, it is, and in, in I think of that in terms of what do we do with materials? We use them, we bend them, we fold them, we subvert them. And that's exactly what we do with history. So it's a kind of material fact that we can contend with. And I think for me, that is one of the ways in which I accept or grant myself permission to use a wide range of references or materials, visual, sonic, and, other, and otherwise. But at the end of the day, it has to be a wholly unique experience. Queen has to become its own work. It has to, it, so it exists within these things that exist, but it ultimately has to exist outside of them or and or in conversation with them. Thank you for that. Thanks, Zoe. That's, I think, so, so interesting. Um, how do you start a work like this? Um, in the reader that was published to accompany the exhibition, you mentioned that you felt like you had been working on this for a very long time and that you recognized that the genesis of this project was actually in a, a a residency that you had done at MoMA about 10 years ago. So how do you, how do you start this? And then how, when you're in the archive, do you know when you found the it thing that you, you feel you need to incorporate into your work? It, it, it's funny, Amanda, because, you know, the question is off, often, yeah, how, how do you start? Mm -hmm. But almost more interesting to me is how do you stop? Mm. So once you create, I, I think of Queen as a form and I'm, as an artist, I'm interested in new forms and how existing forms, painting, drawing, sculpture can generate new forms or at least alternatives within these kind of historically rich existing forms. So queen as a form collapses all of these different mediums and hopefully arrives at something new. So how do you stop that process once you start it? If the conceit is form is always there to be reimagined, reinvented, perverted, subverted, deconstructed, reconstructed, how do you stop? So in a strange way, I'm now can facing this question of how do I stop this project or does this project stop? But to answer your question, I worked on Queen for uh, about 10 years and now I'm sort of gazing out into the future wondering how long will I work on Queen as this kind of iterative disruptive, potentially disruptive form. And 10 years, I guess, in, in the bigger view isn't really that long, but uh, for me, I, you know, it's about, what, a little over a third of my life. So that's, I think, a, a pretty long, a pretty long time. And I began with a question, and the question is the titular is the title of the work, Who is Queen? And I am still fascinated by the potential in, in that language, the who. I'm always fascinated by these kind of who, we, these questions about us, these questions about us from a humanistic standpoint, from a poetic standpoint. And queen is an incredibly rich word. And I've spoken to it as something that was kind of hurled at towards me in a, in a personal moment and 
kind of this moment where I had to contend with the way in which the world wanted to see me and the way in which I wanted to be seen in the world. And that sort of perpetual conflict of how we see ourselves and how others see us. So, yes. I really like what you were saying too about the, the poetry of that question. Um, perhaps, as you say, hurled at you as something that was meant to be um, maybe an insult or an epithet. But then if we, if we kind of draw up the word queen, you have we within it, right? And so you have this really, really wonderful way of playing with word in just a single, single syllable. It's really spectacular. Yes. Another thing that Zoe and I were thinking about too is um, we also wanted to know how does this end? Um, <laughs> the, the, the way that it's built, at least <clears throat> as it's, it's constructed at MoMA, it could theoretically go on forever, right? Um, it's modular, um, it's algorithmic, so there is no reason for it to stop. And so we were really curious about that. Um, Clearly you had to make some decisions in its visual form now. Um, so, so how did you decide that? Um, you know, why does it end where it ends physically? Well, you, you know, I'm very interested in thinking about any work of art as a kind of draft as a mechanism or a means or even a tool to generate something else. And so like I'm thinking about a writer like uh, Rachel Blau Duplessis who did an entire series of books about called drafts where each they were, there were texts but the text all the titles were drafts. And I think that's such a generative way to think about to think through art making, that it's about a kind of persistent re revision. And so when I, and I, and I think that's very applicable to my, the way in which I go about painting, I make a painting, but I don't, but it continues on. And I might use the material that made one painting to sort of spur the next one. And there's this sense of continuity visually, but also conceptually. And that is also a way, yes, to think about Queen because it is algorithmic, it is modular. So even when you're standing in the space of the work, I think knowingly or unknowingly, some part of you starts to imagine all of the different ways it could have composed or presented itself, you know, because it is this kind of grid and even in this image that we're looking at where this work is kind of jutting out from the side, you know, so it's, it's always sort of breaking these boundaries, even though it's also organized in a kind of almost grid-like or linear manner, but then there's all this kind of visual and architectural noise about all these other possibilities at the same time that it announces a kind of order. In terms of, in, in terms of structure, um, you have, you know, the theme of repetition happening um, in the, the kind of scaffold as well as in the, the sound collage that acts as the substrate for your films. Um, and I know something that was also a really generative idea for you in conceiving the framework of the exhibition was counterpoint, um, which is an idea in music um, used to kind of re refer to overlapping melodies, um, kind of similar to, to a canon or a fugue. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how that idea surfaces in the exhibition for you and why you find it so generative as a fabric for exploring um, kind of the themes of, um, of, of, of protest and um, historical investigation that you were tending to um, in the installation. Absolutely. So I, I think that visually, I think 
the end many of the individual works and queen it itself in its totality is a contrapuntal space it is a space where many things are happening at once is, is for me is my, would be my definition of counterpoint it is in other words when your eye or your ear is it is not attuned to one thing but it's attuned to the combinate a combination of things you know and i think that that's just really the the way in which we experience the world we never experience one thing at a time we always experience many things at any given moment what we how our body feels in a space what we're listening to what's being said what we're looking at you know all of these things are happening at once everything is always happening at once and i think there's different ways to kind of draw that out in more specific terms like if we think about protest as a kind of political space it's always this tension between the I and the we and the we and the I and how the individual relates to the collective where there are not singular demands, but there are multiple demands. There are many demands for different reasons coming from different places, even different moments. If we think about sort of the political, in a kind of political art where a, the something is born from or born out of, so I, I just think that counterpoint or that which is contrapuntal, the combinatorial, it's it's a kind of theor it's it's a theoretical and it's also just a, a physical fact of of life of how we experience and and live in the world. And Queen proposes a kind of contrapunt a very specific kind of contrapuntal space. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we were all enriched by that. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, so one, one question that's on my mind um, is the, the sort of presence of poetry and the poetics in um, Who is Queen, um, and also just in your practice more broadly. Um, you know, the installation draws rather heavily from poetry and spoken word. Um, you have the, the T.S. Eliot quote that um, is a kind of framing of the Jack Halberstam film, which is titled, So We Moved, um, which is an excerpt from T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, um, which I believe Halberstam also talks about pretty extensively in, in um, his most recent work, Wild Things. Um, and then of course, as you mentioned earlier in the sound collage, um, you have a, a 1980 reading from the poet Amiri Baraka, um, who, you know, also weighs heavily on your work in other ways. Um, in your Black Dada manifesto, you have, um, you know, a, a pretty um, direct drawing from Black Dada Nihilismus, which is a poem by Baraka. Um, and then also structurally, as we spoke of, um, the 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 videos do kind of have a, a poetic language to them. Um, they use a very nonlinear strategy to articulate their meaning without necessarily relying on you know logic or coherence, um, which I, I think also kind of speaks to the point you were making earlier about counterpoint. Um, all that being said, I'm hoping you can kind of expand on why you felt it was urgent to use poetry in the installation um, and, and what led you to, to Eliot and back to Baraka um, and, and, and again, kind of what, what do you think poetry might tell us about um, the aesthetics of, of protest? Well, that's that's there there your 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 last question is the is the big question. What yes. might poetry tell us about the aesthetics of protest? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, Sorry, it's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> that's that that could be it's well, you know, I think so 
Joan Retallick, the, the writer, gave, brought into my life, into the space of my work, the, the term poethical, mm-hmm. merging uh, poetry or poetics with ethics, poetical as a kind of conceptual wager about, I think I would argue about the potent, the potential embedded in poetry. But I, I think we can even be more open and, and just say the potential embedded in language. And, you know, it, it, it's, it, some of it is tied to this idea that words are what we do with them that that is their meaning you know which is of course this kind of wittenstein kind of you know collapsing of like language and action but i'm interested in how language what kinds of ethical conceptual and visual spaces that language can occupy both and how they announce both in the way in which language announces itself as language just as a as a kind of a tool and a visual reality and of course also by what it says or what it doesn't say and i think that that is something that is per- perpetually happening happening in the work is that there is language but there's also there's this tension of what it's doing what its utility is in any given moment what what is its value or its weight in the space of a painting is it simply a visual tool or is it meant to be read and under Understood. And if it can be read, what does it mean? For example, this simple phrase, we are not, what does, but which in the space of a work will collapse into we, we are, are not, not. So a kind of nonsense. So also what is the, what is the potential of nonsense? What is the potential of noise? Language as noise, language as a kind of void, language emptied of meaning to arrive at meaning. So there's a kind of beautiful coherence. There's a kind of poetry in a lack of coherence, in other words. And I think that's a very useful way to think about language as a generative tool, is that if we move it away from a kind of simplistic mechanism to be coherent, to be understood, but rather we use it as a value, as a kind of a weight or a mechanism or a means to complicate meaning and understanding, we can perhaps arrive at a different kind of social, visual, political space. Absolutely yes to all of that. Wow, <laughs> thank you for that answer. Um, it's interesting to me that you bring up Wittgenstein because of course one of the things that Wittgenstein writes about is that if we see or hear writing and language in our own language, we just slide right into it, right? We, we can't help but read it. Um, and so, you know, I'm looking at this, at this picture right now and I can see the words and they automatically possess not just sign value to me, but meaning value to me, right? This is one of his language games um, and what's something he tries to complicate. Um, If you're thinking about this piece in terms of the art world of New York, where, you know, in a normal year, 7 million people would go to MoMA and see it, um, how do you feel it lives and works for people for whom English isn't their first language? Yeah, you know, that's a very interesting question. And you, immediately when you said that, you, you, this particular work that we're looking at on the scaffolding that announces itself as language, right? But it's English language. So yes, what does that mean to someone who does not speak language or just even has that pause where mm-hmm. it's on their first language where they have to 
translate it, you know, in, in other words, the, the understanding or the, the meaning is delayed, you know, and, but so then it, in a, in a way it, but yet one could still argue that it announces itself as language, but maybe perhaps ultimately it announces itself as form. Mm. So I think it goes, then it, the use of language begins to tie itself back to what I was saying earlier about using the art making process as a way in which to generate new forms. So it is okay for me if the language does not become, does it's not registered, it's not read as language, but only form. And perhaps there again, it can become new form, a new kind of form. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a visual mark, it's a visual line, it's a, yeah. it's, it's a visual suggestion a property even or, or value this actually reminds me of the way that you you describe architecture and the black data manifesto um, repeatedly there's a line um, the essence of architecture is an organic link between concept and form and so i guess my follow-up question would be is language architecture I would say yes, language is architecture, and it's funny that line and the black data. I it was it was kind of tongue in cheek because I just don't think that's true, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it's it's so it, you know so in that particular text, which is now over a, a, a decade old, a lot of the I, it's it's always interesting for me to talk about it because I one, a lot of those statements and phrases were pulled from my library. So just books that I was picking up and maybe leafing through, uh, you know, cause I'm, I'm interested in how a text is generated, you know, and I often use my library as a writing mechanism. And, and I, so I don't consider myself a, a writer or a, uh, of any of any sort, quite frankly. So I think I approach it with a different kind of uh, a band. You know, I'm just sort of pulled for more sort of voracious, uh, but but never casual. If that if that makes sense, even though that might seem like a, a a kind of a contradiction on on one level. But in any case, what I'm trying to state is that I it's it's always troubling or amusing to me is perhaps the better word that I think a lot of the statements in the Black Data Reader are like, oh, this is what he thinks. Mm -hmm. And, and so it actually sometimes it has nothing to do with what I think. And sometimes I'm putting something in, in the space of the work because it's actually not what I think. So it is actually existing to occasion, to mislead or to occasion the prospect of conflict, of a kind of, of different kinds of conflict. It's such a wonderful Dadaist gesture to say something in a manifesto that you don't believe. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> is there anything in, in Who is Queen that maintains that sensibility of, of deceit? <laughs> Frankly, I no, I can't, honest, I can't think of anything. Uh, I think who is queen is, is, a, is, a, is a different kind of raw space, mm -hmm. a different way of revealing or showing something about who, who, who I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's why I've never been particularly perturbed when people have described to his queen as my most personal work to date, because it is deeply personal. And on the occasions when I have had the opportunity to go back to the, the, the atrium and, and spend time with queen, I realize how sad of a, of a work it is uh, sort of melancholic. I feel like it has this kind of melancholic quality to it. And I, and I'm, I have questions uh, around that, but no, there's, there are not statements or moments 
in, in Queen that kind of um, deceive or confuse in that way. There's not that kind of uh, theoretical or, 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 or that kind of play at work in the space of this, this, this piece, though there is humor. Yes. Yes. And, 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 and I, I feel like there is a lot of kind of affective tension between humor and the, and the melancholia that you mentioned before, which I think is what makes it so impactful as a project. There's the cacophony of the sound and of the imagery that we're confronted with, but then there's also these things elicit a kind of, um, an uh, almost irreconcilable um, emotional sensibility um, that the viewer is kind of warring with between, um, you know, this chaos of of hope and um, and despair and also um, and humor and um, um, kind of deep. Um, a lot of the music is is really like tense and charged. Um, so I definitely felt I definitely felt that um, a lot. Um, I have a question building off of Amanda's earlier provocation on on architecture. Um, as an audience member, I was kind of struck by um, the the scaffold as a space of of questioning of openness, and I mean it has this function of um, providing a kind of support for the. Um, the panels and and the sculptures that are kind of ensconced in there, but a lot of it is also empty. Um, and I'm wondering if you can speak to that emptiness um, and how viewers might interact with it. Um, and I don't know, would you call the scaffold an architecture? Um, yeah, I'm just curious about that that sort of emptiness and the tension there between um, function and functionlessness. Yes. Z yes, Zoe, I'm also just stuck on something you said, the chaos of hope, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is uh, such a, for me, that's a kind of wonderfully melancholic <laughs> phrase <laughs> onto itself, the chaos of hope and I was just earlier listening uh, to the raw audio of the conversation that I did with uh, Ruby Sales and Simone White and I proposed bewilderment as a kind of productive space and in terms of how we shape our identities in other words, we don't exist in a space of affirmation. I am this, I am that, but r rather we exist in a space of perfect, perpetual questioning. And Ruby countered that logic where she said, well, as long, she said, there's a difference between bewilderment and chaos. And as she understood it, and I, I'm paraphrasing, and so I'll tread, I'll tread slowly and softly here, but she was basically saying chaos is a kind of is is a is a disruptive force that doesn't allow us to fulfill our full potential of who we might be. And so she described, for example, homophobia as a kind of chaos for to to, to ground ground this a little a, a, a bit more. And so I think about that phrase, the 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 chaos of of hope. But in any case, if I may, without reaching too far, you know, I think architecture is always um thought of as a means to kind of organize or rid the world, perhaps, of chaos. 
you, you, these buildings, these machines, these, these things that we build to house ourselves, to house our objects in, in that way, to house our ideas, to house our potential of, of who we are. And so the scaffolding is, a, is of course, in a kind of architecture and developed through, through many years of dialogue with uh, Frederick Tang and Tim Brennan of Frederick Tang Architecture. Um, huge props to architects and the way in which they, they think about space. And the, the, the scaffolding also creates a space within a space, but you honed in on what is not there, all of the empty space. And that is for the audience. That is for both visual rest, but also theoretical rest, that there's nothing there. So you can imagine what could be there, but it also, again, becomes this way in which you can reimagine all of the things the piece could be. That's, that's so wonderful. And, and I'm, I'm glad you called upon um, that podcast um, that you had recorded. I was listening, listening earlier um, to kind of ground my thinking going into this conversation and was um, really in love with your, um, your, your, your phrasing of, of bewilderment. Um, so, so thank you for that, that answer. Um, and, and also for, for helping contextualize the, the negative space. Um, and I'm excited to revisit the exhibition with, with that context. I think it's um, something too, it, it provides a space also for like imagination or something. Um, Zoe and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, you know, what if uh, the viewer decided to go Dada on this and climb it? <laughs> there, there are ladders everywhere, right? Or, or if you want to use Wittgenstein, what if they performed a willful misreading and actually walked within it as opposed to standing in front of it or behind it? Um, you mentioned the way that architects think about space, but could you tell us a little bit about how you think about space and how you think that the viewer might think about space? Well, I think that that space often announces the I, the the limits of what we can do. In other words, once it 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 leaves the in this more the intangible space of our mind, our mind space, and the more tangible space of the world, when it becomes a built reality it proposes limits. And so in the, the imagination in some way is hopefully at its best limitless, but then the reality of what we see and encounter are the limits. So the architecture one could argue in the space of queen are the limits of the work. I think in a way in which at least physically not conceptually, mm -hmm. but physically. And I think I even use it as such in the way, again, it organizes the paintings, the drawings, the sculpture, and then the things we don't think of as the artworks, the, the lighting, the speakers, the projectors. So everything is housed in this architecture. And it both limits what it can do, but it also allows it to do what it can do at the same time. So it's a kind of a, uh, a, a fruitful paradox, uh, really, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think, if I may, who is queen is also kind of, it represents a problem for institutional space as well. Um, I mean, you're struck as a visitor to MoMA walking up and you're met with this massive structure. Um, I, I think it, we, we must mention the scale. Um, it's five, five stories tall. Um, it covers, you know, it sort of scales the walls of the atrium, like climbs, climbs it almost in this 
um, very, very like alive way. Um, and thinking about, um, you know, what museums represent um, in terms of, I, I think in, our, in terms of architecture, they propose a very similar project to what you described, architecture as a kind of ordering of space. Um, and then who, who is queen is, is a kind of generative disordering where you're met with this structure that is seemingly uncontainable in its size. Um, and also um, you have this, this soundscape that, um, that, pushes, that pushes the boundaries of the project beyond, the, beyond its physical limitations, um, right? So just, I'm, I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about um, where you see this project, um, uh, what it does as a kind of intervention into the museum um, and into ways of, of viewership that you know we're comfortable with and um, ways of uh, uh, you know installation making um, that um, are, are kind of architecturally normative, um, I suppose. Well, I, I think that Who is Queen is both normative and non-normative as a architectural proposal or in, in the space of a museum. And we can go back to that when we were talking about the archive. And if you look at a lot of the different kinds of architectures that have even existed at MoMA in the spaces of exhibitions, there are links that one could organically make to who is queen. But it is also impractical <laughs> to, <laughs> as a kind of architecture and certainly as a, a way in which the a, a museum, I think, to not for an artist perhaps, but for a museum to stage and, and present an exhibition. And I think I was maybe knowingly or unknowingly very excited or drawn to how impractical it was. And the sense that the only thing that Queen uses as an installation that the museum provides, one could argue, is its existing architecture and its power, like literally, as in not the power of the institution, but electricity. As, but everything else is unique and inherent to the work itself. Even the fact that the, the scaffolding kind of it juts off from the walls, it's not against the wall. It's, you know, so it's really trying to move out of one could say of this institutional space. And I lingering ar around, of course, all of this is I, we can't help but wonder or think about this question of what is an institution of, of course, what is MoMA or any museum as an institution? And just to touch upon again, the conversation with Ruby and Simone, one of the questions that I asked them and I also asked uh, Joshua Chambers Letson and Michael Hart is what, what is an institution? But when I, I got even more specific when I spoke to some, Simone White and Ruby Sales, and I said, institutions of anger, institutions of loss, institutions of language. So it, in other words, and that question is just a broadening of thinking about all the kinds of institutional spaces that we inhabit on a daily basis. Just speaking to you, I'm right now occupying an institutional space, which is the limits of language, which is the limits of the language I'm supposed to or think I'm supposed to use to you in this moment. Institute, an institution of loss, the way in which I perceive or understand or move through loss. And that, that kind of logic can continue. Everything, in other words, is a kind of an institution where we are 
consumed in, in, in sort of overwhelmed by the limits of what we imagine anything might be. But that's a much larger uh, conversation. I, I really, I'm, I'm interested in that idea of, of language as an institution as well and how you, circling back to our earlier conversation on um, what are the impacts of um, this exhibition for someone who is not a native English speaker, you know, even for me as, as someone who, who does speak English, I found myself um, coming up against and then sort of unraveling the limitations of language in my encounters with who is queen, um, at, at reading the, the, the text on the panels, um, or I don't know if you can describe it as, as text, the kind of congregation of letters, um, I found myself wanting to assemble meaning and then kind of stepping back from that project and allowing the kind of discoherent um, layering of letters just kind of like wash over me and be what it is rather than, um, I don't know, rather than ascribe or, or ascribe to or search for any, um, any semblance of, of, um, of, of meaning or narrative. Um, but, but anyways, that's all to say, thank you for, for your answer. Um, Amanda, did you wanna close out with a final question from us? Sure, um, thank you though. <laughs> uh, Adam, I was really struck by what you were saying about um, institutional language and the limits of institutional language. And I was thinking about how often you mention um, or, or your writers mention repetition in the Who is Queen reader. Um, mm. You know, people yeah. talk about it constantly in terms of um, the way that words become poetry, the way that sounds become music, um, in terms of like a, a, a space for black culture. But I was also thinking about um, what Derrida says about repetition in that there is power in iteration because you can of course assume institutional language, which is not yours, but you can misquote it. And so then you wind up actually creating some sort of magic almost. And of course the magic he's thinking about is art, right? Um, this really wonderful way of repetition then creating something totally new. Um, he talks about it as abracadabra, this, this repeated language. But we might also think about Duchamp um, using the ready-made as repetition and then through transubstantiation, as he says, creating art out of nothing. And so I'm curious for you to talk about repetition and um, its force for you. Um, it's a, a power, but it's also a form of resistance. And so I, I would love for you to talk to us about that. Thanks for that question, Amanda. And I, I think it, it's one, one time is never enough. <laughs> one, one, one could say, you know, first dance, last dance, you, you know, it's, I'm, I'm struck as the, as the person or as one of the people who has kind of built this work ground up that even when I enter into this, the space of it, and so there's repetition and then there's repetition and difference. And I think that my work in general and Queen in particular is in, interested in using repetition to articulate difference rather than a likeness or sameness and how the, the same thing heard differently is something else. And so I, I, I like these kind of what these, what you could almost think of as a kind of slippage where the same thing, the same word, the same sound heard again becomes heard differently, becomes something else. And I think that is the, the power of record of, of, of repetition. 
-hmm. It's, um, I mean, in your work, it's a visual homonym, right? Um, yeah. But also, again, too, when, when we hear or see or say the same word over and over again, it becomes nonsense. So even if it has meaning in its initial iteration, in its reiteration, it starts to lose meaning. And there, too, I think that Derrida would say is kind of its power. Um, of course, people would say he's pre-Wittgensteinian here, right? Because, of right. course, Wittgenstein talks about this, too. But that's something else entirely. And also to exhaust, right? Mm. To, and so if we think about Deleuze, to exhaust something, the exhausted, exhausted language. So I also am always thinking about repetition as a means to exhaust something. Not so much that it becomes nonsense, but rather one could say that it becomes the essence of what it is. I think that's really wonderful. Zoe, do you have anything more that you want to add? Um, not in particular. I think we are, we're coming up upon 2 p.m. Um, so I, I think it's just about time to open it up to audience Q&A. Um, so I don't want to add too much more beyond um, a huge thank you to Adam for um, such rich and robust um, and thoughtful answers and provocations. Um, it, it really was a, a thrill to be in conversation with you today. Um, and, and thank you for really such a um, paradigm shifting installation at, at MoMA. Um, and I, it, it really is a, a treat to, um, to be around for it. Thank you so much, Zoe and Amanda for this incredibly thoughtful and uh, it, I, I enjoyed myself thoroughly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam and Zoe and Amanda. This conversation has been really exciting for me. I've been kind of jumping around a bit and like looking around my room and all of the Renee Gladman things that are written on my walls and, I, ah. and I'll talk to you about them later. But um, for now, we are going to open up our Q&A with a question from GE Schwartz. GE, I'm passing you the mic now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda and Zoe, and of course, Adam, and thank you, Ty. Um, the question is, do you in any way see the idea of queen as an intercessory kind of role as mediator or mediatrix in a kind of salvific redemption? I, I want to say no but I'm, I'm not exactly sure I understand all the contours of your question. Okay, simply put, we know that historically, yeah. a queen is the intercessor a lot of times between the people and the king or, or beyond. So I'm just wondering if this is a wonderful, almost device that you've created as a kind of mediational or a mediatrix, you know, um, uh, that, that also, in, in, you know, is empowered with the with magic and strength and spirituality to get us to those other places. Well, then my answer becomes yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, GE, and thank you, Adam, for... Uh, I love a, I love a yes or no answer. We don't, we don't get a ton of those over here and it's exciting when we do. Um, and now I, I said I was gonna like save it, but I, ugh, I'm excited. Um, I, the whole time you three were talking, I was like thinking about architectures and the line and Renee Gladman and all of these things that run rampant in my head. Um, and then Adam, you were talking about you, uh, chaos and you were talking about how um, like we can look at uh, your example was homophobia as as chaos and how um, I was wondering if like conversely that could be considered as a 
like a, a dumbing down, like a, a an oversimplistic view and that chaos could be the response in thinking about um, then when you were talking about repetition and how there's like a certain amount of nonsense baked into repetition, I was thinking about um, the like samurai sword, the way that samurai swords are made by like folding the steel over and over again until you get the bubbles out and you have this like really strong thing. And I was thinking about the folding over of nonsense until it becomes architectural. Does that make sense? That I, I, it, it does make sense. I do just want to expand upon that comment. And, and I will now own these statements as my own and not attribute the thinking to anyone else. But if we think about homophobia as a kind of chaos, that it for me that is simply to suggest to say that there is no order of things so whenever we have you know an ism homophobia or you know racism it you know that is suggesting that there is a, there is some order to something so to suggest there is order to anything as I understand it, is chaos. It breeds chaos. In other words, not to allow things to, to be, to exist in, to be in flux, to exist in their poetic potential breeds chaos. Thank you. I, yeah, that's, that makes sense to me. I was just, I was, running rampant over here. But I didn't answer your, 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 your question about the line, but if we think about the sort of, again, architecture or even lines as the opposite of chaos, it, it's, it's always what we do with the material, what we do with, with, with the form, or, or as I understand it, that, that matters the most. And I was I was thinking also about the um, the like architecture of the of the scaffold with um, the line of the language and how those interact. And I was just very interested. So I'm I'm very excited to go see the show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we have another question. This one from Lynn Crawford. Lynn, I'm going to pass you the mic now. Thank you. Sorry, I have a little rasp. But I kept thinking so much of a beautiful Gertrude Stein quote, which I might be paraphrasing, but it's, there's no repetition, there's only insistence. And I just wondered what you, what you thought of that. I, I think there's, there's obviously a kind of uh, Steinian, element to the way in which language and repetition <laughs> is used in Queen. But I also think that from an intentional standpoint, in terms of intention, and I think intention is very critical, is, is very important when we think about the way in which something is made or how it exists or occupies space in the world is what what was the or is the intention and i think my intentions while in terms of form and and from a historical standpoint there are there are links to say someone like gertrude stein i think my intentions are 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 different um but it, on on in in regards to that that the language of that quote, that phrase, I think, I think it's great. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree. I never would have conflated your. Oh um, yeah. No, no, no. I, I'm, there's no, I'm not saying there you should or shouldn't. I'm, no, I hear what you're saying, but I think that idea of um, repeating something, <clears throat> sorry, as opposed, it, it sort of, um, re repeated exposure to something you're you're making it and people seeing it it takes on a different um tenor and 
and it's almost like it makes you rethink the word insistence. There's something really beautiful about something that was familiar and then it's not, and then it is, and then it's not. And I just, I was really, um, I'm very moved by that element of your work, so. I think that's an interesting conceit that through rep repetition, something becomes both familiar and unfamiliar at, at, at the same time. And I've always been fascinated by that, by that prospect or by that encounter that mm -hmm. for me, only repetition can create this feeling of, I know this, I don't know this. But again, and I, you know, I said sort of flippantly, first dance, last dance, but I am also convinced that we don't hear any, we, we don't necessarily hear anything the first time or the second time or the third time. You know, it, it, there's kind of this, there's sort of almost on some level through repetition or uh, also a kind of refusal to be understood on mm -hmm. some level. Uh, which I think is is co complicated, complicating, and complicated, but uh, very interesting to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for that question, and thank you, Adam, for your answer. Uh, we are now going to close out our Q and A for the day by going to Fong Bui. Fong, you can unmute now. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Amanda and Adam for an amazing conversation. I'd, uh, I was a little bit distracted, but still there are beautiful phrases being brought up, contour of your question, humor and melancholy, chaos of hope and tons of other phrases. <laughs> it's terrific. But um, you know, even people who don't know your work, Adam, like I remember taking cousin of mine to see the show and she brought up the relationship between sound and image immediately. You know, the audio visuality that seemed to explore back and forth also things that come in together, conversion, and then things that falling apart, diversion. And it's so interesting to look at the uh, steel metal, the structure, you know, the scaffolding that allow, because it's solid, it's structure and architecture and it's rectilinear and it, it, it allow the text and the word to do that, to go to get to come together and fall apart. Uh, and in a way, I can't help but think of the idea of it being a theater, you know, it's a theater that frames what Wittgenstein, since Amanda brought up, you know, his work quite repeatedly. And so is your book also years ago, Black Data Reader. A and uh, he would say once, philosophy is not a theory, but it's an activity. And it's so interesting in, if we think it's an activity, then the idea of be it chaos, chaos of hope, be it human melancholy, as Zoe pointed out, and so on. I feel there's a visual, visceral responsiveness also that adapt differently to different space, different condition, different time, different context. Because I remember also seeing your show at the, the Lever House. That was what, may have been in 2018. Wow. Hugely different than this one, you know, who is queen at MoMA at the moment. Uh, so my first question, I have two. The first question, I wonder whether you are aware of the uh, Hakim Bay classic book, Adam, published in 92, is called TAS, Temporary Autonomous Zone, where he spoke about the necessity to activate the space in between have yet been bureaucratized structure and whatnot, where a certain condition, even the, the, the light of the day, where a dog can become a wolf. You know, so it's really activate this negative space in between. Mm. And that's, I think that is very visceral. So I wonder whether you have aware of the book or not. Still, how do you determine what's the point from the very beginning for each project undertaking to embrace that space so differently, so fittingly? 
to to specific um, you know idea that you wanted to generate so to answer the first part of that question no not familiar with the book but will uh, make myself familiar with the book now and uh, I think I mean, I like this idea of the in between, the in between spaces as the the spaces that demand or need to be activated. And I also think, you know, you I think you can see that the the way in which I conceive of a work of art like Who Is Queen or in ex or an exhibition like the other exhibition you mentioned. Yeah. that the the space it, it is it is not it is not simply where the work is but it becomes a part of the idea so the, the space is the idea and it, it's it, it it's it, it it fascinates me just as an artist that these spaces if we think about them as an integral element as an idea that exists within the work we create, I create, yeah. I'm not responsible for it. You know, so there's always this kind of collaborative moment when a, when a work of art is, is conceived, this kind of loss of control, lack of control. Uh, and that's also, in a strange way, then relates back to these kind of in-between spaces, but it's perhaps where things are not controlled or limited by institutionalized or institutional spaces. These in-between spaces are ignored. They're about transitioning, about trans or transitions. Okay. I and I think that's of of of. of of interest and importance. And yeah, you know, I, I, as we know, that the, there always been this um, perpetual tension, maybe even one can call it romance uh, between black and white. You know, I think that we think of even in American Gothic, you know, all the way down to abstract expressionism, we think of the Kunin, particularly late 40s, 48, the black and white paintings, Pollock certainly done his share, and Klein and many others, and mm. and that that seemed to continue and persist in a in a variety of way with the uh, early Shindy Sherman's work, recent show of Robert Longo who came on our NSE also we spoke about that a bit, Christopher Wolf for sure, Karen Walker, and our yeah. friend Jane Marshall, you know, Carrie uh, Jane Marshall. So I think that. Since you um, sort of respond to G's question earlier, I like that idea of the contour of your question. So my que the contour of my question is that how you know I how do you see, see your deployment of of that kind of black and white polarity as color uh, in relation to the rest of the people I mentioned in, in the context is not a, a historical question it's just a, in a personal you know um, I would say aspiration I, I love that question Paul I you know I don't think of it as one a polarity yeah. but what I love about your question is all of those artists that you mentioned or moments in their work from Cindy Sherman to Robert Longo to to Carol Walker to Will, Willem de Kooning yeah. you know what you don't, you'd never think about the work, the, the black and whiteness is not what you think about. And so that's what interests me is just sort of in, I'm using what is essential, what the work, what I understand the work to demand. And so, but I'm never thinking about it in terms of black or white. You know, I'm so in other words, I'm kind of always trying to uh, mobilize, give space to a, a visual or conceptual or, or, or th theoretical ideas. And yeah. so the, this, this black and whiteness is, 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 is a kind of a, 
a, a device or, or tool, um, but it's also a kind of distraction, you, uh, but hopefully a, 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 a productive one, one that both announces itself and is muted, is silent at the same time. You know, I want to, I would, that with that list of artists that you, you quickly made, I would love one. Of, I would love this. Uh, Lorraine O'Grady did. I think it was in 1981 or 1983. I can't remember the exact date. A, a, the black and white show, where yeah. basically everything that was in in the, in the show had to be black and white. And I've always wanted to revisit that that show with, uh, again, an, an important word with a different kind of intention. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay, I be, I'm greedy, so I ask one more question before we turn on, to, we, 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 we give the mic to, uh, you know, Amma here, but um, you and I, when we first met, roughly around 2013 or 14, 13, I think maybe, you know, we, we briefly talked about your relationship with Solo with. So as a youth, you met Sol, and he kind of, you know, but I don't know, the relationship seemed to be a very paternal one. Well, a very I, productive I, one. Well, so I can never, you well, share with us how did all that begin? I never met Sol in, right. in person. It was all, my relationship to him was always through the work. Yeah, that's what I meant. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Through, through, oh, so paternal absence. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, which fortunately is not my case at all. Um, but, well, you know, it, he, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's sort of, you know, what, what are, where are we now? Are we kind of in like a, neo-conceptual moment still or you know are we beyond yeah. concept where are we um i i don't i don't know i would love to think more about con conceptualism mm -hmm. or but again i think and i keep coming back to this word of intention and yeah. i think that's what always changes the most between or within even uh, any given historical moment is the intention of the artist, of the writer, of the architect, of the filmmaker. Yeah. So while it might superficially announce itself as self-same or self-similar, the intention shifts and is different. And because of that, the way in which it then influences and shapes those ideas and spaces that it occupies, I think is different as well. Yeah, it's, uh, well, it's, it's ongoing generative installation, generative assemblage. It's not easy to pinpoint and uh, label Adam's work, that's for sure. <laughs> so uh, congratulations on a beautiful, important show, Adam. Thank you. Please come see you, the show, you guys. And now I turn the mic back to Ty. Thank you, Fong. And thank you again, Adam and Amanda and Zoe. Uh, we are now so excited because at the rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Alma Birch, to the stage. Poet Alma Birch is the author of three books, Faces in the Clouds, Sonnet Boom, and Ferguson Interview Project, and a video game available for Android, Space Quake by Alma Birch. She has a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from the California Institute of the Arts. Alma, please take it away. Hi. Uh, can you all hear me all right? All right. Let's... Uh... This is a, in such a, a, a wonderful conversation. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. And um, it, I wanna make sure I'm, I'm reading the room and uh, metaphorically speaking. And uh, you know, I, I kept thinking about Elaine Badu and I kept thinking about this whole idea that we're really coming together. 
and, and how structuralism is really part of that conversation on uh, what we can fill the space with. And so uh, I'll take that to mind as I uh, embark on this reading. A, B, zero, two, zero, five, seven, seven. Sallow night, worms magnified with moonlight. Sammy, are you here? A plate falls. Don't know why I didn't come. Pull the espresso shot. Drench the pool of light from the moon. Ho! That was unnecessary. I am not the wolf. I am more like a slimy eel these days. Let me pull you closer to me. The chest is full of gold. Children going home from school, dancing, crossing streets, staying with you for all time. Who can say when will the cookie come back? You don't know what the nights are like missing the perfect laugh in secret. Oh, put some ice in it. Sing out loud and go to the moon. The light sings a beautiful song. Francis is here, but a saint. Play that music. Swing, swing, swing in spring. Lost and insecure corn muffin. Hold on to me. Slurp. Can I enjoy a drink? Another day with ketchup on the counter. Wind swept off feet and the Milky Way, did you find yourself? Heroes bleed, would you like some more hot water? First, break all of the rules. Does it feel like home? What's mine is yours. Crumple the paper, shake the plastic bag. Gregorian chant, fade into overtones. Eat more whipped cream, rule the world. Come back, yes, yes, cough, cough. Puppet on a chain, hand me a napkin, stand by me, the smell of coffee. Can I get the deluxe? Can I be a star? Open the gates, flood the oranges, cry with the raw meat. No one knows my name. Black Gotham Walking Tours. Sarah and Angelina Grimke. Walt Whitman's body is built on the backs of slaves, the birth of a nation. Oh, captain, my captain, the rise of the new Negro on the ashes of Sojourner Truth. American history is black history. Let the show begin at the new federal theater with Woody King Jr. and the Zoki Shang for all the colored girls, nurses singing Rise by Riser, Elizabeth Tyler, Edith Carter, give me a rose, all the pink collar women and men who face voters suppression, businesses on fire, lynch mobs. Remember 1863, the slave riots on the west side in the West Village, charred and dragged, burnt and discarded, black bodies bleed. Once I walked across the state of Alabama, it hurt to sweat each day. I was with the NAACP. I was with Ida B. Wells and the boys. I was with Rosa Parks, step stepping, step stepping, step stepping, step stepping. The big fake, gentrification on the Hudson, public art or public fart. Artists on a boat, George Washington crossing the Delaware, spirit trumpets blow, 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 Matta Clark. Hammond's approaches, the skeleton of empty cathedral echoes, old New York, let me walk on water, step right up, folks. There's nothing to see. It's Jersey. It's for the birds. Hudson quakes, boats with lights pass, 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 pass. pass. Hudson freezes around days and flash back to another time, cruising men, prostitutes and drugs sail next to a cathedral at Pier 52, light breaks through, holes cut, 
striking water below, looking through. My eyes are here for the show. Birds soar, light strikes from above. Metropolitan Avenue, CVS, pharmacy, open 24 hours, Minute Clinic, Fresh Pond, car wash, open seven days, entrance, tropical restaurant number three, 186661 Tropic, Comedia Topeka Costeria, Ecuador Rama, Queens Instrument Co, Auto Air Conditioning, Sideshow, Skateboards, Clothing, Accessories, Tattoo, True Blue Piercing, Roadmasters 2, No Crap, Bad Credit, Instant Approval Rating, as low as 1.99%, Spot Delivery, Plates and Registration, All Vehicles are New York State inspected and warranty, veterinarian care group, parking for beach, bum, tanning only, beach, bum, tanning, beach, bum, sunless tanning, infrared services, centers, urgent care, Taco Bell coming soon. Mother, daughter, daughter, to mother. Well, mommy, keep keeping on. Your life has been a rock. It's so hard to move. Ragged, jagged edges, and there are small slithers of chips, and you've been climbing that rock, and you were born barehanded, where you put your bloody hands, and the pain bursts hard, and there's a fiery feeling that won't stop. Sometimes you braid your hair, there you are making a rope. You wrap it around and the rock moves. Don't stop now, because when you're done, mommy, keep going and make that rock into a chair and grow old and tan, turn to sand and fly until you land. Trees, trees, trees. Dedicated to everyone who worked to save East River Park and every mature tree in East River Park. Cut, 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 down, 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 down. Delancey owned a cherry orchard. Where have all the cherry trees gone, 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 gone? I was born during a blizzard on the Lower East Side. My parents walked in this park. Trees, 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 trees cry our names down, 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 down the block. I went to high school. Shout out to my classmates in the future. We, 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 we will all be gone, 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 gone. Cuts, 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 still bruise. What can be done for trees, 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 trees. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alma. I'm I'm shy to just turn my to turn my mic back on and follow the strength of that. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us today, and thank you again, Adam and Zoe and Amanda and our friends at MoMA and Pace Gallery that helped make today's program possible. As always, we will share the recording of today's program in our YouTube archive, so it will be available in a day or two if you'd like to revisit the conversation. And we here at the Rail do this every day. So please join us tomorrow, or ooh, it's Friday, y'all. Join us on Monday at 1 p.m. for a conversation with artists Zorowar Sadu and Rob Swainston and rail contributor Andrew, Wol Andrew Wolbright on the artist's current exhibition at Petzl Gallery. And we will conclude Monday with a poetry reading from Imogen Christian Smith.
And now you may all turn on your microphones and try to follow Alma's powerful words with yours. <laughs> Thank you, Alma. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Adam. Thank Thanks, Amanda. You. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you Thanks, very Alma. much. Alma. That was amazing. Adam, that was great. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. Such a good reading, Alma. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Alma. Thank you, Ty. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Zoe, Amanda, Fong, Nick. Bye. Congratulations to the show. And go see the show. Okay, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Bye. weekend. Okay. Let's Bye. go to lunch. Take care, everyone. Take care. Thank, Bye -bye. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye